Hi, this is Shia Rubinoff. I'm here with Insights in Tech. I'm here with Jonathan. Jonathan, please introduce yourself to our audience. Tell them who you are and what you do. Hey, well, hi, Shira. My name is Jonathan Nguyen, uh, and I'm a vice president of Fortinet, and I'm on the Glo Global Field CISO team. And basically, we're a bunch of former CISOs that travel around the world advising uh, enterprise teams and boards on cybersecurity. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. I'm honored. So, Jonathan, we've moved to a world of telecommuting. The future of work has not yet been defined. The elements of remote work will stay and even grow from the way that we're doing things before and what we're doing now. Given the majority of workforces are telecommuting, what would you say are your top considerations when dealing with critical apps? Yeah. So I think now we're, we've shifted it in, in such a fundamental way. I think remote working and teleworking were interesting notions before this event. Um, but the practical reality is that across both public sector and private sector, only about maybe 20, 25% of the workforce was actually remote working. Um, and certainly things have changed. And it's, it's begun to make us think about different operating models. And, and, and applications and workloads are, are, are part of that. Um, but it's taken us to a point where now we have to support a large part, 80, 85% of our workforce is working remotely. And therefore, within the context of applications, or amongst the CISO conversations I've had, it has been around you know, classifying your data, your workflows, your applications, the criticality of those applications, and where do they reside? Are, are they in your own perimeter? If you still have a perimeter, are they in your own private cloud? Or are they, are they in the public cloud? And then it goes back to the entire DevOps process with regards to application security itself. So from, from conception to service delivery and lifecycle management, just about everything that we deal with in security, especially around applications now, has to be rethought out to make it much more robust, more so than ever, just because of the way DevOps is working today. And it's done remotely, right? Um, you really have to have security built in from the onset. So you have to have security wherever the data is being generated, it's being curated, it's being generated, it's being stored. Yeah, no. Certainly true. And digital transformation is disrupting businesses, as we know. Data and applications are at the forefront of organizations, new business models. So data needs to travel across extended networks at increasingly high speeds, 5G, without interruptions. To make this possible, organizations are now adopting multi-cloud environments. So as speed of data escalates and having many points of areas to protect, how do the challenges to, the, to secure data change? Yeah. So it, it changes from a, a couple of perspectives. Uh, the, the first point is, is that um, what we're seeing now is really driving distributed computing. And this notion of connectionless commerce, connectionless education, connectionless healthcare, connection, connectionless public service, mm -hmm. all of those things are driving more edge-based computing. They're driving more towards a hybrid distributed computing architecture and ecosystem. 5G will enable huge volumes of data to be generated, to be transmitted at very low latency and high reliability and high fidelity in many ways as well. So we will see things like augmented reality, uh, artificial intelligence, all driving these digital transformation. And you'll see that specifically today in, in telemedicine. But at the same time, it, it, it has a huge challenge for security teams because if you think about it today, most of the research suggests that somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 percent of all data breaches before this pandemic was discovered by victims or law enforcement. Yeah. So that suggests that at the current or pre-pandemic amount of data being generated, we were struggling to identify the data breach. Now, post-pandemic, as we drive further towards digital transformation and 5G-enabled edge-based computing, well, that was a mouthful, um, you're going to see teams if they're lacking things like automation, if they're lacking machine learning capabilities, if they're lacking really deep artificial intelligence capabilities, then they're going to be challenged. Because on the one hand, you've got to have the ability to process huge volumes of data, but you also have to have insight. So your artificial intelligence engines are only going to be as effective as the quality or the accuracy of the data that's going in. And, and then the automation side of the house, even if you have perfect vision and contextual understanding of what's happening, the sheer volume of data and the scope and scale of these distributed ecosystems means that humans aren't able to keep pace with that. And so lots of disruption, lots of change. But one thing, interestingly, amongst my conversations with CISOs hasn't changed, which is the business outcome and the customer or employer employee experience, irrespective of where you work. And finally, we're beginning to think of work as something we do rather than a place we go, right? 
um, irrespective of, of how that's done, the, the outcomes haven't changed and the expectations on security teams and operations teams hasn't changed. They still have to deliver those operating metrics. They still have to deliver the security metrics, the compliance metrics, the business drivers, as well as the customer experience. And that's a heck of a lot of, a lot of challenge. Um, one of the things that, that I've seen, yeah. in fact, there was a, a posting on LinkedIn today from a buddy of mine, and he posted a picture of his home sock. And so he's running his sock from his home, and each of his tier three analysts have the same setup, and it looks like something out of Star Trek. There are just about a dozen screens, multiple keyboards, and, and a human looking over all these things. So, yes, I, I think the big trends uh, going into and out of this pandemic now are well, what we talked about before. It's just expounded more. So acceleration, the, the amount of data, the, the speed at which decisions and data-driven decision-making needs to be done, mm -hmm. uh, the complexity of our operating environment, our regulatory environment, it just grows, right? Sure. And then security challenges are only going to grow as well because we certainly have seen more targeted attacks, right? In fact, um, one of the most interesting things that I saw coming out of this was a guidance from this around zero trust, mm -hmm. which is our presumption now. I mean, up to this point, there have been lots of questions with boards and folks saying, well, Jonathan, you know, what's the likelihood that we're going to be breached? Uh, we were discussing the that. The likelihood in the past was, shall we set up ourselves in case we get breached? Shall we set up ourselves in case there's a cyber attack? But as time moves on, we're all very aware that it is happening. It's going to happen. So assume it's going to happen. It was almost like, do we have privacy? We assume we don't. <laughs> you know, it's almost yeah. a similar type of look now. We have to be prepared because it is going to happen. Right. In yeah. fact, I, I, I was raised some eyebrows when I read the guidance itself, and it was assume that your operating environment, your cyberspace, your own network, any network that you may enter a course through is a hostile environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, assume that your devices have been compromised Correct. and they're now actively attacking you, that you operate in a malicious hostile environment, and then presume that those of efforts have been successful. And so, on the one hand, we're, we're, we're suggesting that zero trust is the right strategy in combination with things like segmentation. But on the other hand, we're also essentially saying that assume that those strategies, effective as they may be, have already failed. Correct. And so that's making me think about what CISOs are discussing as we come out of this pandemic. What does reasonable care look like once you assume that you've already been breached, compromised, and most likely owned at some level? Correct. Right. And that means yeah. that risk management now needs to be a balanced approach between both the prevention detection, but now we should also invest in threat and, and, and risk research. And so if you know that if, if, if NIST and government agencies and, and, and standards bodies and industries are suggesting that you've already been breached, then you really also need to look at the dark web, look at those dark web markets, uh, market sites, you know, essentially the cyber pawn shop to see whether someone is is asking about you or offering things about you. Certainly, I think also a bit of a switch has been being very reactive to the cybersecurity world. And I think most organizations, if not all, have taken the posture of being proactive as well as reactive, needing to be ahead of the curve and not just waiting for it to happen to react to it. So that's certainly been a big shift in the cyber world as well. Yeah, I think so. And the other thing, interestingly, I've seen is just the sheer number of recruiters that have been pinging me. And, and I asked, well, why is that? Because it, it was kind of quiet un, until this pandemic. But when mm -hmm. you've got, you know, a recruiter ringing you once at least every day of the week, at least during the first week, they were telling me there was a realization amongst their customers that having a CIO that handled the traditional roles plus security was no longer adequate. That you re they really were looking for a specific executive leader who handled the security aspects for their enterprise. I thought that was, I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. That is, well, that is very true. And we saw the shift actually coming even before the pandemic. Even boards were realizing that they need to have a proper cybersecurity uh, person, whether being you know not just a typical CIO or CISO, but somebody who's very well versed in cybersecurity to present themselves on the board at all levels. So that's a, certainly a shift that I was waiting to happen. So that's important to see. Yeah, and so I, a couple of trends have been happening as well. Uh, I think there are organizations who have come through this, this incident, if you will, yeah. and have been relatively successful to their peers, those that had already started their cloud migrations, who had already yes. digitized yes. And, and, and done their data and their app classification process, are weathering this a bit better. 
But one thing I've, I've seen amongst my, my friends and, and colleagues is that after this, this event passes, everyone is going to want to be cloud native. Oh, yeah. uh, every, there's going to be, whether we're moving beyond strategic initiatives, and, but everything from mundane day-to-day -day applications to the critical applications. Correct. And we saw the shift happening beforehand, but I agree with you. It's going to start ramping up quite quickly. And so the challenge comes now, if there was a shortage of, of skills and even a larger shortage of, of, of experience, right, on everything from the shared responsibility model to migration plans, how should you migrate, what should you migrate, um, those shortages are even now more acute. And so the, what I've been hearing about uh, around the corner is going to be a huge demand for things like cloud architects and security architects. Um, and so the other concern amongst service providers is going to be, can they actually scale to meet this level of demand? Um, but conversely, uh, on the other hand, if you will, because remote working is here to stay, that's, that's, that's going to change a lot about how we conceive of work, right? The industrial psychology about large corporate campuses and commercial real estate, uh, the latest trend in open seating and centralized seating with no barriers amongst people. I'm wondering how that's going to change as well. That's um, going to be interesting. And, yeah. So I, I think there's some pretty profound changes, but as we move towards a more distributed and remote workforce, what we used to consider as enterprise grade capabilities and features, functions and security aspects, now need to be replicated in homes and, and more branch branches, right? And so on the one hand, we've got this migration uh, of applications and workloads and to, to clouds. But on the other hand, because we have a much more distributed workforce, you know, I'm seeing for folks who are, who are essential in the leadership positions deploying SD-WAN to their home. So they have WAN optimization. Yeah. And because they are privileged access, you, know, you need to have a, an enterprise grade level of security you know, where you're working because security goes wherever the data goes, wherever the user is, wherever it's being. Well, you just, you just touched on something important. Security goes wherever the data goes. I think security needs to go wherever the data goes. And that's being realized because that hasn't always been the case, which has led to major, major breaches as well, certainly from a human factors perspective. So as you're mentioning that this type of enterprise security needs to happen is very critical point. Yeah. And the other part is this, our traditional approaches around behavioral-based detections and, and uh, are a little bit challenged right now because Sorry. everything is anomalous in the first six weeks. Yes. Uh, there are more logins that, and sessions that have never been undertaken before. Credentials are just being issued in some cases. Devices are just being issued in some cases. And so a lot of teams were struggling around, well, I'm looking for anomalies, but everything looks like an anomaly right now. <laughs> Um, and somewhere amongst those anomalies are some malicious at, actors as well. And so I, I've seen them really focus in on those privilege access holders, those sysadmins, the folks who hold the keys to the kingdom. Um, and I think they've been pretty successful with that. And I, I think uh, that has been one of the, the interesting surprises. You know, I, I, well, it's I, down to the human element almost of protection. Think about it from the security perspective. It all almost goes hand in hand if you take that security piece of technology out you're just down to the basics of human security so that part was interesting i thought more people would call me for help desk support right i was like <laughs> i did get that from my family but i was expecting more more about so how how good is my home security how do i go about changing things on, on my home router what should i be prepared for but no i, I got other questions which, which was kind of startling but the big Sorry. disruptions um didn't happen which tells me that a lot of business continuity plans were, were executed well, um, and, and they were able to save that off. Now, behind that is is another underlying thought, which is, well, what is it that you haven't seen? Um, you know, how many breaches have actually occurred, but we haven't seen the actual, the damage yet, and is that about to come out? Um, and so we're, we're still waiting on those results. But yeah, I think definitely uh, our, our our notions of of work. Uh, and computing and networking have, have changed. Um, but I think out of this, uh, security is going to be much more important. Um, and, I, and I think that it's going to be, we're going to see better uh, security metrics uh, in the outlying years from this. Oh, agreed. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Indeed, always a pleasure. This is the best call and video conference I've had today. So thanks for Wow, I'll take that. Thank you. Well, have a wonderful day, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon.